Okay, we, we've done it? We've done it. Okay, good. Yeah, oh, thank you. Woody Young, thank you. Okay. Well, let's just get, as long as I'm taking a little poll here, how many of you believe in one God? Got you, huh? <laughs> Great. Good. Okay. So we're on common ground there, huh? Good. Good. We got that sort of settled. Maybe. <laughs> how many of you believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? Can I see something? Now, wait a minute. Isn't that three? Huh? No. No? I thought it was three. What do you think, it's four? <laughs> we have a theological problem here. We've got an arithmetic problem. You know. <laughs> One God or three? Interesting. One of the things I thought we'd explore a little bit is the Trinity. And um, I've gotten a lot of questions on this. And um, I'm not a theologian. I love the Bible. I've, taught, you know, I've studied a lot for 40 years. But I really uh, am comfortable, most comfortable in the expositional side of things. I'm not a theologian. Not professionally trained in that sense. And maybe that's an advantage after, what, after, after the reading I've done lately. Um, but one of the questions we all have is how do we, you and I, how do we, not, theolog not with theological definitions, how do we reconcile that uh, concept? One God. One God. And boy, that's emphasized. We'll jump before we shortly into the Shema and all that. One God, that's for sure, right? And yet... Especially in the New Testament, we, you know, it's just throughout, from beginning of the New Testament, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we sort of nod in agreement, we accept all that, we, and yet, uh, interesting problem. An interesting problem. And um, so, this concept of the Trinity, of course, is, has been at the heart of intense theological controversies throughout the ages. Some of the greatest minds, Christian minds, have wrestled with this, and um, so uh, the uh, it turns out that all kinds. The more you deal with this in a, with, with with what's called rational apologetics, the deeper quicksand you can get into very quickly. Because it'll turn out, the more you get into this, you'll discover that almost any expression you begin to frame in this area turns out to be full of potholes, minefields, call it what you will, and. Um, so, uh, and the more you attempt to study this from just an intellectual or rationalistic point of view, um, the more misunderstandings occur. One of the reasons I think that uh, we stumble in this area so easily, and I'm not going to take you through all the different theological expressions and why they're wrong, or at least wrong in the minds of other theologians, it's a real minefield, tough, tough area. And uh, I think one of the reasons is all of us indulge in models. And uh, there have been many, many models or concepts been suggested to try to get across this idea of three in one. One God and yet three persons. And that's a glib answer, yet what do we really mean by that? And, and uh, we could spend a lot of time. Some people you will talk about things like power, intellect, and will as an analogy, or body, soul, and spirit, the, the uh, trinity of man, the, you know, the trilogy that makes us up in a sense. And those are all misleading because they imply you know, functional differences. They don't, require, they don't really imply personalities. I'm not going to get into any of us that might have three personalities. That's a whole different problem. <laughs> but uh, uh, we, uh, many... Writers talk about motion, uh, speaking of the sun, speaking of motion, light, and heat as examples of, a, of three things that are sort of complementary and yet one thing. And all these things are fraught with major, major um, problems. They may be convenient to sort of get us through a discussion, but they're very, very frail in terms of being sound concepts. Perhaps we get a little closer when someone suggests maybe a chord of three tones. So you have one sound and yet made up of three three notes or something. And that also sounds great, has some problems. <laughs> the other thing that's often mentioned, especially in our technological age, is the idea of white light being composed of three primary colors. You take the white light with the prism, you break it up into the three primary colors, and, and that's often used as a, as a mechanism to get through the discussion. And yet, you start examining any one of these, that really begins to fall apart very quickly. And uh, uh, I have trouble with this topic because I've never had trouble with this topic. 
I somehow have never just gotten hung up on this, and I realize that's, in this case, a liability. I was always disturbed at the Naval Academy because uh, the Naval Academy staff consists of uh, civilian professors, which were specialists and really sharp guys, and they also had guys in from the fleet that would have a tour of duty for two, three years of the academy teaching. And we found out that the policy of the Naval Academy was to assign, when an officer was assigned to the academy for a tour of duty as an instructor, they always assigned him the courses that he flunked. And, and I was always bothered by that policy, you know. And um, fortunately, there were guys around that were pretty strong that offset that. But it was an interesting policy, and born by the idea that the guy that had trouble getting through those subjects is most likely to be effective at trying to help the midshipmen get through theirs. That was the concept. It has a lot of holes in it. I'm not going to defend the concept. But, uh, but I remember... And I, in a sense, that's been my problem in trying to deal with this topic because as I've gone through my Christian experience, frankly, I have never gotten hung up, particularly, with this issue of the Trinity. And I keep getting questions about it, which is one reason I decided to you know, dig into it a little more deeply. Um, and I guess one of the reasons I haven't had too much of trouble is for two reasons. First of all, someone with a mathematics background, I think, recognizes that when you start dealing with things called infinity, uh, uh, you're beyond your ability to even define things, let alone deal with them. And I think a mathematician has a certain... Uh, humi- I never would like to use the word mathematician and humility in the same sentence, but... but uh, <laughs> I think there is in a certain uh, intellectual humility in terms of the whole concept of infinity. You can take a series of numbers, 1 plus 2 plus 3, onto infinity. What does that add up to? Infinity. So they, they'll do an infinite series taking, one, taking every third number, 1 plus 4 plus 8, 7, etc., and, and make a series. If you add that up, it adds up to infinity. And you take you know, uh, um, 2 plus 5, etc. You take, in other words, you can make three series that are di- distinct that all add up to the same sum. And so they, you, you play around with those kinds of ideas and mislead yourself into thinking you understand the Trinity. And um, uh, so those are all uh, uh, things you'll encounter if you do any reading in this area, but they all have holes in them. But uh, before we go on, uh, as I wandered through some substantial, a substantial library in this area and finally came up for air with all this, it, you know, theologians tend to make very, very definitive uh, uh, definitions and then they become victims of their own definition. So much of the crossfire is really um, semantics or quibbling or what have you. But I, I thought it would be appropriate before we jump into this subject to remind you of a poem that impressed me when I was a small child. And uh, it's about uh, the six men of Hindustan, uh, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is nothing but a wall. The second, feeling of the tusk, cried, Ho, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp, to me tis mighty clear, this wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal, and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth who chanced to touch the ear said, Even the blindness man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact who can, this marble of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing upon the swinging tail that fell within his scope. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, and long and strong, though each was partly in the right, and all were in the wrong. So often theological wars. The disputants, I ween, rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean, and prate about an elephant not one of them has seen. And after wading through a lot of books, I'm also convinced that there's an awful lot of writing in this area that is, uh, 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 I don't believe, is illuminated by the Holy Spirit. (laughs) So, another reason I've had trouble with this area is because I've adopted a model that's probably also wrong but it satisfied me enough to focus my attention in other areas because I'm basically a businessman 
And one of the things you encounter in business is the concept of a corporation. And if you had a corporation of three partners, three shareholders, partners, that were perfect people, always communicating and never at variance with one another, uh, you have a model, at least in my mind in pragmatic terms, at least satisfied me for a certain uh, substantial portion of my own intellectual history. So uh, again, these, all these illustrations are clumsy, inadequate. The more you get into this topic and read in this area, the deeper you can get into quicksand because uh, uh, you're missing the real issue and that's one reason, one of the main fruits I think we'll gain by exploring this a little bit isn't just the substance of the issue but also some methodology. And uh, now, but before we go into that, uh, one other question. Can you imagine yourself, um, and let me just use an example from one of our guests here. Uh, suppose you're in the outback in Australia, and you ran into an aborigine, or maybe a better, uh, more neutral example would be, uh, suppose you're in some remote island and ran into a Neanderthal type of tribe of some kind. And you are going to explain to them a television set. How would you do that? You would try to use something they did understand and you'd create an image or a model or a concept that would be adequate for your purposes at the moment, but certainly in error if we looked it over as to what you explained. Now, you'd, you'd indulge in oversimplifications and what have you that would obviously be technically uh, pretty marginal. How would you explain to an uh, aborigine uh, a 747 and how it works, how it flies? And if you tackle some of these kinds of subjects, uh, it's very obvious that um, in a didactic way, a pedagogical way, you'll indulge in models that are um, rather uh, simplistic. And uh, maybe that's part of our problem, is that we are dealing in uh, those kinds of areas. One of the things I think most of you may have seen our briefing package called Beyond Perception. And I'll just touch on that briefly on the way to our subject matter because one of the things we're beginning to realize in our day is that even physical reality, as we might envision it, is beyond our ability to perceive it. You and I are used to three dimensions, length, width, height. We may know intellectually that we actually live in at least four dimensions because of Dr. Einstein's classic work, which demonstrated that time is a physical property that we actually live in a four-dimensional space a thing called, called space-time, continuum called space-time. Planck's constant there's a four-dimensional constant. Well, in particle physics today, they actually realize that we live in ten dimensions. Four of them are measurable, and six of them are curled in less than ten to the minus thirty-three centimeters, and therefore inferable only by indirect means. So, even if you're dealing with physical properties we're suddenly at what scientists call the boundaries of reality itself. And uh, we, deal, we try to deal with that, and it's biblical implications in our little briefing package called Beyond Perception. But I mention this because we're going here tonight in a, uh, to explore a little bit a subject that goes beyond the physical world itself. We could completely confuse ourselves just talking about the physical world. Now we're going to step out one step beyond to try to talk a little bit about this thing that we might call the Godhead. One God and yet in three persons. Glibly spoken and yet what are we really dealing with? Um, now there are many, especially critics, that argue that there's a basic absurdity involved in trying to say one is three and three is one and all of that. But there really is no absurdity involved if what is contended is that plurality can coexist with unity. If plurality can coexist with unity. And let me give you an example. Adam and Eve, when they came together, are one flesh. So I got a little equation here that says one plus one equals one. Do I, is that bad arithmetic? Probably. But what we're really talking about is having plurality coexisting with unity. And maybe in a very clumsy way, that's the beginning of an insight. But let's just start with this whole business of one God. You know, let's, let's first of all get in, in, our, in our minds this issue of one God. Now, every Jewish person, every good Jewish person, uh, of course, uh, quotes uh, frequently the, the, uh, uh, the Shema, as they call it, the Shema. You'll find it in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. 
And once you see it, you'll be, it'll be very familiar to you. In fact, in every Jewish household, as you enter the, the door, there's typically on the, on the door jam a little thing called a masusa, which carries some scripture. Usually, not always, but usually the scripture roll in, hidden in this little thing that is uh, on the d a door that they typically kiss or touch when they go in and out of the door has the Shema in it. So it's probably the most venerated portion of Jewish scriptures, of course, is the Torah. Within the Torah, of course, uh, one of the most quoted portions is this uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 and following. But we'll take the verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. You say, well, that's Old Testament. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus in Matthew 22, when asked what was the greatest commandment, quotes this as the greatest commandment. So without getting into those issues, you recognize, I think, that there is, is, uh, is uh, uh, no valid dispute about the validity of this passage to all of us. One Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And uh, now it's interesting that this whole concept is emphasized by God Himself in the Ten Commandments. And uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and uh, and so forth. In, in Exodus 20, as as one rendering of it. Um, and we could take other examples. Let's let's uh, take a look at um, Isaiah 45. Relax, there's about, uh, only about 150 of these references, but we're not going to take them all tonight. But we'll take a few to get this in our, in our focus here. In Isaiah 45, we have this unusual letter that God drafted by name to Cyrus over a century before he was born. That when Cyrus ultimately does read it, realizes that, that, uh, that the God of the Hebrews is God and lets them, and, and we conquers Babylon, he turns them loose to go home, he turns the Jews loose to go home. But the point is, you get down to verse 5, as part of this passage, God makes a <clears throat> uh, major assertion. Verse 5 I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. So this is one of those passages, and there's others, of course, uh, in Isaiah, Job, Psalms. You can, you, can, you can easily make a long list of these that emphasize that God is unique, singular, one, and very jealous of that position. In fact, he says so in the middle of the Ten Commandments. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, and so forth. He uses that term. Maybe in a very special way, but use that term. Now, it's interesting. I thought we'd start from here and take a look at a couple of things. It turns out in the Hebrew, there are several words meaning one. One is yahid, which is unique. But the other one is echad, which, means, which does not preclude distinguishable entities. And that's the example I give you is Genesis 2.24, where Adam and Eve are said to be one flesh. There again, you see, it's that same word, echad. Now, and that is incidentally the word that the Hebrew uses in the Shema. So it turns out that even with the focus we've talked about so far, within the linguistic structure is the, the fact that that unity that is being emphasized does not exclude having a plurality within it. That's a strange idea, but it's, it's, it's even in the grammar. And let me tell you how interesting it is in the grammar. Let's talk a little bit. This is not a Hebrew lesson. I wouldn't be qualified to do that. But all of, how many of you have heard of a thing called cherubim? Yeah, it's pretty good. Singular is cherub, right? And I think most of you are biblically sophisticated enough not to confuse the biblical cherub, cherubim with the, re, the Renaissance art idioms. The cherubim or cherubs you see in the Renaissance art motifs are, have nothing to do with the Bible. So let's just erase that part of it. I think most of you realize that. If you, you have all kinds of ranks of angels, but at the top of the heap is the cherubim. They guard the throne of God. They guard His holiness. And they show up in a number of places in the Scripture. In one of the passages we'll look at in a little bit in Isaiah, 
we encounter a similar group of super creatures called seraphim. Some scholars think the seraphim and cherubim are actually the same thing, just described slightly differently. Others think they're distinct. Who knows? We'll wait and see. But the point is, a singular cherub, the plural is cherubim. In, in some Hebrew nouns, you make a plural by adding im, equivalent, transliterating. Seraph is a singular. Seraphim is plural, right? Well, with that in mind, with that little Hebrew insight, let's turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Bible opens with seven words, 28 letters in the Hebrew. Bereshit barach Elohim, the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Very, very exciting verse. We could spend a month of evenings just talking about Genesis 1-1, the discoveries that have been made about these interesting, peculiar letters laid out here. But what I want, so we don't get distracted from our central purpose, we'll just look at a couple of critical things. Bereshit bara Elohim. The word Bereshit in beginning, which the ancient Hebrew writers recognized means that time and space began, not just matter and energy. Very interesting insight, very contemporary insight from the point of view of modern physics, incidentally, even though it was first recorded uh, in the Hebrew Talmudic tradition by uh, Nachmanides in the, in the 12th century. And I'm always fascinated by that observation. But in the beginning, God created. Now the word created there is bara. It's one of three words that could have been used, but bara emphasized that it came out of nothing. And physicists, by discovering the parity principle, that all particles have a counterparticle, etc., uh, have even commented it's as if the universe was built out of nothing. Interesting. They ought to read Genesis a little more carefully. But the word Elohim is what I want to focus on. It's one of the se there are a number of names of God in the Scripture. Three major ones, many other derivative ones, but Elohim being one of them. Yahweh, Jehovah, pronounce it as you will, being a second and Adonai being another. Now, the name Elohim emphasizes the creation. But what's interesting about the Hebrew word Elohim, you've already probably noticed yourself. It's a plural noun. Elohim. It ends in the I am ending as, as you transliterate it. It is a plural noun. And yet the verb bara here is a singular verb. It may surprise you to discover that every place that Elohim occurs in the scripture is a grammatical error because you don't have the noun agreeing with the verb. Normally, if you know anything about languages, uh, that uh, you have you, in many languages, more so than the English, you have, they have to agree very rigorously. And interestingly enough, we have a situation right here in the uh, first few words of the Bible where if you know your Hebrew, you are set back because technically it's a solecism or an error or a, or a construction carrying an idea. And what's fascinating about this, right here we have, if we look carefully, a subtle insight that this one God, the verb bara treats it as a singular noun, and yet has something about it that implies a plurality more than one, within the one, if you will. And that's, I think, rather interesting. It turns out that the vowel pointing of the word Adonai can also be viewed that way, but we'll keep moving on. Um, Paul also, in, in one of his Thessalonian letters um, in the Greek, uh, does the same similar kind of thing. Now this idea in Genesis, obviously, is not just confined to the Hebrew of Genesis. It actually surfaces through the translation in the English in a number of places. Uh, let's pop down to verse 26 of this chapter. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Interesting phrase. Notice what it says here. God said, Let us who is he talking to? What's he talking about? 
Now, some theologians say, well, it could have been angels. It turns out not so. They didn't participate in the creation. God did that. And you can, you can tack, tackle, that on, you can tackle that idea from, on, on some grounds. Let us make man in our image. I underline that Bible. Just to remind me when you get there that God is talking to himself. I used to, uh, I used to sometimes, uh, when I lived at the Bay Club, I used to get up real early in the morning and use the racquetball courts by myself just for a little workout by myself. And the, when the regulars start showing up, when they signed up for it, I'd get out of there and let them play. And, you know, you played by yourself? I says, yeah, I play, play myself. The only problem is I can't stand the arguments. And, uh, but this is that kind of thing. God is talking here. We're going to discover that in the scripture there is a trialogue between three people recorded in the scripture. We'll get to that before we're through here. But as we're looking through Genesis here, let's go over to Genesis chapter 3. And verse 22. When Adam and Eve blew it, they're about to be expelled from Eden. Verse 22, the Lord God said, Behold, man has become as one of us. Plural. Interesting. This happens enough that you can't dismiss it as just an idiom or a figure of speech or a rhetorical convenience. There's something, it, 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 it's beginning to take hold. Let's, uh, I want you to notice the consistency. Let's go over to Genesis chapter 11. And we have this famed event of the Tower of Babel. Where the people united in rebelling against God and making a, uh, a, a monument to that effect. And, um, and they will do that again, of course, when the final judgment comes. But in any case, in verse 7, God declares, Come, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech, and so forth. Let us go down. See, the, see there's a few places where the translators couldn't really escape this peculiar plurality of nouns implied in the Godhead. So we have one God, and yet even in the linguistic structure, we have hints here of a plurality. Beg your pardon? The question I was interrupting in the tape here saying, that what did the Jews say about that? Well, you have two Jews, you've got three opinions, first of all. Okay, so I don't, I don't know what the Jews... So, okay. No, the... the, 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 the uh, let's just keep going. Um, you'll also... I mean, we, can get, we, we can, you know... Uh, the other thing that I'm going to encourage you to look at, I won't take the time tonight ourselves in the study, but you can take a concordance and look up the angel of Jehovah, or Yahweh, if you will. Um, it's an interesting expression. We find it in Genesis 18, 28, uh, Joshua 5, Judges 13, Zechariah 13, elsewhere. The angel of Jehovah. And as you read those passages, you begin to realize that that phrase, the messenger of Jehovah, if you will, is... Uh, not just an angel. For example, in Joshua 5, Joshua is commanded to worship him. And that raises some interesting questions. You, angels generally will not allow worship. Daniel tries, John tries, they're always rebuked. No, you don't worship me, and so forth. There's one angel that wanted to be worshipped. He got in a lot of trouble. And that's, a, that's a study. That's a study for another. It's Lucifer in, in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. You can, you can get the background of the uh, career of, uh, and destiny of Satan, originally called Lucifer. Now, those angels will not allow themselves to be worshipped. Yet in, jo in, in Joshua chapter 5, we have this particular angel who uh, Joshua challenges. Like I said, he, he encounters him. He's got a sword drawn. He looks like a man. Angels always, they don't have wings. Well, the chariot of them do, but I mean, the, they look like men. They're usually mistaken for men. They take form that you and I, in fact, the scripture tells us many have entertained angels unawares. But this one has drawn a, has drawn a sword. And, and Joshua, military commander of the host of Israel, says, uh, he challenges them like a sentry. Are you for us or our enemies? And this uh, angel says, take off your shoes, you're on hallowed ground. Which is the, the, a phrase chosen if for no other reason, then Joshua will remember that 40 years earlier, when he was with Moses on the mount, he heard that and so forth. So this is, of course, the voice of the burning bush. This is the, in fact, he identifies himself as the captain of the Lord's host. You and I miss that somehow because when we think of a captain, we think of a two-bar officer, a company-grade officer. 
The term captain there means like the leader, numero uno. There's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Joshua didn't fight the battle of Jericho. Jesus did. But then again, that's another study. But I, I touch on as we go. The idea of the angel, we encounter throughout the scripture then, a person. The, pre, the pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Jesus Christ. Before his incarnation. And yet, involved in what's going on. Literally uh, uh, leading the primary attack in the conquest of, of the land. Uh, they, t- they tackle the, of the seven tribes they were facing. There were ten total. Three had already been dealt with before Joshua took over. There were seven. Gee, that's interesting. Seven less three. Sounds like Daniel, Revelation 13, doesn't it? Interesting. In any case, uh, uh, they, they uh, uh, tackle the toughest one first, the Amorites. The capital of the Amorites was Jericho. Jericho means the house of the moon god, incidentally. You can make something of that if you want to study the sword of Allah and that sort of thing. But we'll keep moving. But as they tackle that, it's interesting, almost every rule in the Torah is broken in that battle. The Levites were exempt from military duty, yet they led the procession. The Ark of the Covenant wasn't supposed to go to war, it led the procession. And uh, well, what does he do first? He sends in two witnesses in advance. That's kind of interesting. What did they accomplish? They get a Gentile bride saved. A Gentile, excuse me, not bride, Gentile woman saved. And um, they um, march around once a day for six days. On the seventh, they're supposed to rest. No, no, on the seventh, they do seven times as much. And of course, uh, they keep silent during this entire period, and then they, at the end, they blow their horns. You've got to be kidding. And shout, the walls come down. And you look at Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. There was silence in heaven for half an hour before the seven trumpets, etc. So you begin to realize the book of Joshua is a model of the book of Revelation. But in all of this, we see Jesus Christ prominent in the Old Testament, usually personified as the angel of Jehovah, or Yahweh. And uh, interesting, so what's his role? Is it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, becoming a little enigmatic as we go, so we should... And also something else, if you're going to do it, there's a third person. We talk about the Father implicitly, the Son implicitly. There's, of course, the Holy Spirit, the so-called third person of the Trinity, as we sometimes characterize him. The Spirit of the Lord. In the second verse of the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and the Spirit of God brooded above the face of the waters. Creation is ascribed to the Spirit of the Lord. You want us to do a study of the Holy Spirit, you start with the second verse of Genesis 1. Not just Acts 2, if you will. But in Isaiah 40, 48, 59, 63, a lot of other places, you have the Spirit of the Lord all through, the Ruach Elohim all through the Scripture, the Spirit of God. And uh, so... uh, Interesting, as we study the Old Testament, just an Old Testament perspective, if we're studying it carefully, we begin to sense that hidden in the language is this concept of a plurality in one, without losing the unity. See, most of us assume, because of our own experience, where you have plurality, you've got dissension. No, no, we're talking about unity here. Perfect unity. And yet, three persons. There are all kinds of errors you can fall into. Some people say, well, gee, that's three modes of the same person. No, big mistake. They have distinct identities, and we'll come to some of that. Uh, one of the most interesting examples of this is the second psalm. The second psalm. Turn to Psalm 2. It's interesting to give, this, to give an assignment to a group and just say, read Psalm 2 and explain it to me. The more you read Psalm 2, the more difficult it becomes as you start thinking about it. Psalm 2, verse 1, why? It raises a question. Somebody raises a question to somebody else. Why do the nations rage and the peoples imagine a vain thing? Because they have Clinton as a president. No, no, no. Ooh, yeah, I'm sorry. Fill in the blank. One's as, good as, one's as bad as another. Why do... No, not really. Anyway... Why do the nations rage and the peoples imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Whoops. Two so far. The kings of the... First of all, the whole idea of the world taking up arms against God sounds a little arrogant, doesn't it? And yet, that's what's coming. Not just in theological terms, in, in, in even deeper terms, in more, in more pragmatic terms. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against who else? Against His anointed, the Mashiach, His Messiah. 
That's what the word anointed means. Saying, and this is what these rulers are saying. Now it's quoting, in effect, these, the rulers of the world. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Many years ago, there was an advertising campaign. I forgot who put it out, but they always had something of it. You don't mess around with Mother Nature. They always had someone, you know, that got in big trouble because of Mother, you know, Mother Nature. It was just a facetious little humorous thing. But every time they did that, I, could, I always thought of Psalm 2. <laughs> because can you imagine the arrogance of people? Speaking of God, let us break their, you know, his bands asunder and cast. By the way, notice the plural. Let us break, not his bands, their bands. Interesting. Their bands asunder. And cast away their cords from us. Now we have some editorial comment added here in verse 3 or 4. He who sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Laughter at the throne of God. At whom? at the presumption, the arrogance of the world leadership. Boy, you can see that coming. Verse 5, Then he shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his great displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill in Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Wow. That has an echo of familiarity to us, doesn't it? We, this is probably referring to something more climactic, and yet we obviously, if your memory serves you well, recall the baptism of our Lord. And at that baptism, there were three people present. The Father whose voice spoke, right? And the dove that de and the Spirit of God that descended like a dove. I have no idea what that really means. We always picture a bird, and maybe it was, or maybe that just a figure an expression of it descending, but in any case. And of course the son, here we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have the Trinity in view in at the baptism of Jesus Christ. But we're getting ahead. We're getting we're we're sneaking a peek in the New Testament. Now, one of the things that I'm, one reason I wanted, one of the many reasons I wanted to sort of explore this study a little bit isn't to get into deep theological water in terms of the nature of the Godhead and the Trinity, although we need to just see what the, Revel what, what the Scripture reveals about it. And that's where we should not uh, shirk from that. We should find out what the Scripture says, and yet at the same time confine our perceptions to what the Scripture says. To the extent that models or idioms are useful pedagogically, great. But let's not build our theology on them. But let's, uh, let's finish this uh, little thing here. Uh, the Lord said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Now you may recall that one of the immediately after the temptation of uh, the uh, baptism of Jesus Christ, he entered into that period we call the temptations, where Satan tempted him, and there were three specific temptations enumerated in the Gospels, both in Matthew four and Luke four, recorded. And you may recall one of them, where somehow Satan takes Jesus at the pinnacle temple and shows him all the nations of, or to Mount shows him all the nations of the world. I don't know if he did it by video, how he, what mechanics he used, but he showed them all the nations of the world, and Satan made the claim, they're mine, and I can give them to whomsoever I will. Interesting, interesting event there. Satan is not making an empty boast. If he, if he was, there is no temptation involved. If you walk up to me and you want to sell me the uh, uh, local you know, fashion island, I'm not tempted to purchase it from you because I'm not convinced you own it. But at the same time, uh, it's interesting that Jesus there doesn't challenge the premise to Satan's offer. That's profound. Who owns this world? Satan does. Who owns the media? Satan does. 
And all you have to do is look. Read. Watch. Satan was offering Jesus a shortcut. Don't go by the cross. Do it the easy way. I can give them to you. Interesting. Here we have in Psalm 2, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now this verse, of course, becomes a identity link because this ruling the nations with a rod of iron becomes an identity in the book of Revelation as a link. The book of Revelation is in code, but every code is explained somewhere else in the scripture. Nothing will convince you more that this, these 66 books written by 40 authors over thousands of years are an integrated message system supernaturally engineered from outside the time domain itself. And you discover that many ways, one of which is take the book of Revelation and discover that every cryptic expression there is anticipated and unraveled for you somewhere else in the scripture. And you begin to realize that you have in your laps one message, penned by 40 guys over thousands of years, but these 66 books are an integrated message, supernaturally engineered from outside time itself. But continuing verse 10, Be wise now therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they who put their trust in him. I love that bumper sticker you see. Jesus is coming, and boy, is he mad. <laughs> a, little, a little irreverent, perhaps, but it gets the message across, doesn't it? A lot of people see Jesus Christ as that suntan carpenter who walked the shores of Galilee, petting the kids on the head, telling everyone to turn the other cheek. Boy, are they in for a surprise. He's our kinsman redeemer, yes, but he's also our avenger of blood. Same guy, the Goel. Interesting, interesting study in its own right. Now, one of the things you can do on your own when you get home is reread Psalm 2 and figure out for yourself who is saying what to whom. You'll quickly discover that this psalm involves a trilogue, if I can use that expression. Three people. Some of this expressed by the Father, some by the Son, and some by the Holy Spirit. So you have, interestingly, right here in the first psalm of the Hebrew Bible, Psalm 2 is actually the first psalm, that Psalm 1 is like an introduction, so it's a little, there's some numer counting problems. But anyway, the point is, Psalm 2, as we know it, is um, a conversation between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, interestingly enough. It's interesting that the Son always speaks of the first person of the Trinity as my Father. It's always my Father. There is one exception to that. And that exception he himself highlighted in rather dramatic fashion. His first words as he hung on the cross was not my Father. My God. Why hast thou forsaken me? The only time he doesn't address him, because at that moment, his hand was against him, because he was hanging there for you and I. He was hanging there in our place. Interesting. And he dramatized that not only by quoting on the cross, but tying his words, both his opening and closing remarks, are codified for us in Psalm 22, which opens and closes with his first and last words on the cross. And, of course, describes the whole crucifixion scene from first per, in first person singular from the cross as he looks down. He quotes the way they're making fun of him. He describes them dividing his garments and casting lots of, for his vesture. He describes the fact that his hands and feet are pierced, even though that was written seven centuries before crucifixion was invented. It was written about 800 B.C. and uh, crucifixion was invented about first century B.C. by the Persians. Picked up and developed by the Romans. Interesting. Give me vinegar to drink. All my bones are out of joint. You can read it on your leisure. It's, it's, a, it's a marvelous, marvelous meditation for a quiet time. Now, one of the things that we all have a tendency to do 
is we, re- we encounter these different names of God. There's actually quite a list, but there's three, they all derive from three primary ones. Elohim, Yahweh or Jehovah, and Adonai. And many of us sort of presume, without thinking too much about it, that they sort of refer to the Trinity. They do collectively. One of the disturbing discoveries you'll make is that those three names are ascribed to each of the three persons of the Trinity. The Father, of course, that's pretty obvious. The Son is called El in Isaiah 9.6. Yahweh in Psalm 68.18 and Isaiah 6. We're going to look at Isaiah 6 shortly. Isaiah 45, we find Yahweh used of the Son. Elohim speaks of the creation, the creator God. That seems to be the emphasis of that particular label, that particular title, that particular name. Jehovah, as it's classically called, or more properly perhaps Yahweh or Jehovah, whatever, um, the, the Tetragrammaton, the four letters that make up the unpronounceable name, are uh, always signify the covenant relationship with Israel. And Adonai, the owner or Lord, a master of it all. So each, each of the names emphasize a particular relationship, but they don't confine themselves to one of the three persons. That's kind of interesting, and as you think about it, what you'd expect. And um, the spirit of, uh, is also ascribed to Yahweh and uh, Elohim in Exodus 31 elsewhere. The particular references will be in the notes of the company of the tape for those of you that want to get them. But I'd like to take a particular passage that, um, uh, again, is, is illuminating, and that's to turn to Isaiah 6. Several times in the scripture we have, we have a, an opportunity to behold the throne of God. Ezekiel 1 and 10, Isaiah 6, Revelation 4 and 5 being... Uh, manifest examples of that. Isaiah 6 is an incredible one. Let's just pick up the first three verses. Isaiah, in the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train, or shul, his skirt, if you will, uh, filled the temple. And it stood and uh, excuse me, above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and two he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then it goes on, and, and it gets really quite exciting. The scene here, first of all, is the holy place of the temple. Now those of you that have studied the tabernacle or the temple know that the innermost sanctum is called the Holy of Holies. That's our English translation, the Holy of Holies. Its precise label is the, it's the holy place of the holy ones, plural. Now this is the, uh, the, the site here then is the residence and the abode of the holy ones. And it's celebrated here by the seraphim. In the Ezekiel account, we have cher- they're described as cherubim. And in Revelation, we have them described as the living creatures. And clearly, if you compare the language of Ezekiel and the language of Revelation, what Revelation and Ezekiel are talking about seem to be the same things, the four faces and all that. Some scholars suspe- suspect the seraphim might be distinct. Some feel it might be the same. Um, you can't really clearly resolve that. But it's interesting that they veil their faces from the holy ones, And they say, what do they say? Holy, holy, holy. The Lord of hosts. Now, when you get down to verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who shall go for who? Us. See, again, it's plural. If you look carefully, it's always plural. Now, the question is, and also you got the Lord of hosts, right? Again, we have an interesting expression there. Now, this Lord of hosts, whoever he is, let's explore that a little bit. For that phrase to refer to the Father, I think that's easy. I think most of us could acknowledge that's quite comfortable. But it's kind of interesting that in John 
hold your place here and turn to John chapter 12. John 12 is a precious chapter to me for many reasons. There's many wonderful truths revealed in John 12. But one of the most difficult, one of the things that threw me when I was very young in the Lord and zealously studying my Bible and devouring everything I get my hands on, I encountered this concept that, well, Isaiah didn't really write Isaiah, there were two Isaiahs. And uh, I had all this erudite stuff that I got into and uh, that there really were two Isaiahs. And I got into, the, I encountered what is called higher criticism. Nothing higher about it at all, but that's a, anyway. But uh, on the one hand, I didn't really buy it. On the other hand, I discovered it undermined my faith. Well, Moses didn't really write Genesis. There were these five guys, J-E-H and all that business. Um, again, I didn't really buy the documentary hypothesis, as it's called, and yet its existence disturbed me. It shattered my very direct confidence in the scripture itself. It was many years later that in John 12, now by the way, you can destroy the two Isaiah theory many ways, but the most interesting, the Holy, there is no heresy on the face of the earth that isn't anticipated by the Holy Spirit, if you look carefully. In John 12, there's a quote in verse 38. Verse 37 says that he'd done many miracles before him, but they didn't believe him. Verse 38, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he, which, uh, which he spoke, Lord, who hath believed our report? To whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, be converted, that I should heal them. Setting aside a specific argument, what's interesting about this is the first quote in verse 38 is from Isaiah 53. The second quote in verse 40 is from Isaiah chapter 6. What's exciting is verse 40, uh, uh, 39. Therefore they could not believe because that Isaiah said again. In other words, John tells you here that Isaiah from verse chapter 53 and Isaiah that wrote chapter 6 is the same guy. Same guy. Boy, what a precious discovery. You can just not waste your time screwing around with the Deutero-Isaiah theory, what have you. But my, my point is, though... Verse 40 is a quote from Isaiah 6. But I want you to notice what verse 41 says. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Who is John talking about? The Lord Jesus Christ, who did the miracles that led to this whole discussion. So John is ascribing the Lord of hosts in Isaiah 6 to Jesus Christ. That's kind of exciting. That's kind of exciting. Now, let's see what Paul has to say about this. Let's turn to Acts 28. Acts 28. Let's pick up at verse 25. Paul here is turning to the Gentiles. It says, When they had agreed, not among themselves, they departed after Paul had spoken one word. Well spoke by the Holy Spirit, by Isaiah the prophet, unto our fathers, saying, Go unto these people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. Again, Paul is quoting that same passage from Isaiah 6. But notice who he ascribes it to. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So interesting, the, the plurality that's involved in the Lord of hosts includes the Father, According to John chapter 12, the Son. And according to Acts 28, the Holy Spirit. How interesting. All three are here identified. So maybe this holy, holy, holy isn't just emphasis. That's one possibility, a figure of speech. Holy, holy, holy. Boy, are you holy. Holy, holy, holy. I mean, you know, it's a way of underlining like. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe the holy, holy, holy is a testimony to the Trinity. Let's turn, hold your place here because we'll probably get back, but to turn to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation 
Revelation chapter 4, John is caught up before the throne of God. And he sees these four living creatures, the cherubim. Verse 8, the four living creatures, each of them had six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Interesting. Same echo, isn't it? Same phrase. I regard that as testimony between two witnesses. But getting back to the Old Testament, I just want to sensitize you to uh, always look carefully. Turn with me to Genesis 48. Genesis 48. You may recall when Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery to the Midianites and then ultimately sold to Egypt. And you know the history how he rose to fa ultimately to favor before Pharaoh, became the prime minister of Egypt as God's way of providing for the nation. They go in as a family to come out as a nation in effect. But while in Egypt, Joseph takes a Gentile bride and by that bride, of course, has offspring. Ultimately, of course, the family comes down and gets united. When they do, the, 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 uh, the father, Jacob, comes to also. And, of course, he finds that Joseph has these two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So Jacob, in effect, adopts them as his own. And he blesses them. That's why, even though Jacob had 12 sons, there are 13 tribes. Because the two sons of Joseph were also ordained, if you will, as tribal heads. So it's really 13 tribes. That's why, throughout the Bible, when you see these lists of the 12 tribes, you can always get 12 tribes, whether or not you count Levi. Whether or not you count Dan, or whatever. You'll always notice that the lists are always 12, even though, if you look at those lists carefully, there's about uh, 20 of these lists in the scripture. You also discover that uh, they're always listed differently, and they're also that they um, uh, may or may not include Levi, whether if it's a, he was exempt from military duty, so he's not in the count of March, and yet, of course, he's, uh, you know, clear. The way you do that, if you want 12 and you want them all, you have the tribe of Joseph. If you want to drop one of them out, you take the tribe of Joseph and call it Ephraim and Manasseh. So you've got an alphabet of 13 from which to select your 12 is the point. And it's very simple once you understand it. If you're trying to read the Bible cold on your own, it can get very confusing. But in any case, in chapter 48 is the occasion when Jacob comes to bless the two sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. We won't go through the whole story, but that's just the context. When you get down to verse 15... Well, incidentally, it's kind of interesting that in verse 13, Joseph took them both, Ephraim on his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh on his left hand toward Israel's right hand. He assumed that Manasseh, being the older, would be the more favored. And it would be natural to position him to his father Israel, or Jacob's right hand. Brought them near him. But when Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the young, he crossed his hands when he blessed. And that disturbed Joseph. He didn't expect that, and it bothered him. Anyway, Israel stretched out his right hand, laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, ruling, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, did walk, the God who fed me all my life unto this day, the angel who redeemed me from all evil, bless, these, bless the lads, let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow unto a multitude in the midst of the earth, and when Joseph saw his father, and he, you know, Joseph gets upset and so forth. Anyway, I just, that's the context. I'd like you to notice carefully this blessing of Jacob. This is in Genesis now. Genesis 48. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk. No problem. The God which fed me all my life long unto this day. Two. Three. The angel or messenger, if you will, which redeemed me from all evil. And then go on, he blessed the lads and so forth. God before whom I walk, the angel who redeemed me, two persons, the God who fed me, that makes three. Jacob mentions these three in a rather elaborate preamble to his blessing as being the object of divine worship and the source of blessing. 
God the Father, leader, or teacher, the Goel or the Redeemer, and God the source of illumination, sanctification, comfort, and feeding us. I suggest the Trinity. Now those of you that want to continue this line of inquiry, you look at 2 Samuel 23, verses 2 and 3. You look at Isaiah 48, verses 16 and 17. You look at Isaiah 63, uh, 7 through 10. You look at Psalm 29, verses 3 to 5. But let me take a little different tack. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes. Chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, and so on. While the evil days come not, for the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Interesting phrase. The word Creator there is mistranslated. The, the word is in the plural. The word is in the plural. Check it in your Hebrew uh, resources if you can. Remember now thy Creators. It's a plural noun. Of course, with a singular verb, inter interestingly enough. Now, if you turn to Isaiah 54, verse 5, familiar passage, For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. <laughs> kind of interesting. The word maker is in the plural. For thy makers, plural, asa, it's a plural construction. Thy makers is thine husband. Yes, it's grammatically st strained. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Interesting. But one of the climactic places to take a look at these kinds of things, most of us are familiar with the Old Testament benediction. You'll find it in number six. Numbers chapter 6. Numbers 6. You've all heard this. Many people use it to close a church service. Verses 24 to the end of the chapter. 24, 25, 26, 27. Numbers 6, 24. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. Verse 24. In other words, the benevolent love of God, the Father of mercies, the fountain of all good. Bless you. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The redeeming and reconciling grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 26. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. The purity, the consolation, the joy received by the communion of the Holy Spirit. Now, you might find this interesting. Just hold your place here or make a mark when you want to go back at it. And then just turn to 2 Corinthians. This is Paul's second epistle to the Californians. Called, uh, no. You don't believe it, you haven't read the book, book of Corinthians. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. He closes, Paul closes this incredible uh, epistle. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And I suggest you examine yourself to see if the so-called New Testament benediction isn't precisely parable, parallel to number 6, verses 24 to the end. Now, I started getting into this Trinity thing for two reasons. One is because, first of all, a lot of people have trouble with it, and at least as you begin to explore more carefully the Old Testament, you begin to realize that the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. One book. 66 books written by 40 authors of thousands of years. So there's two issues, two benefits. It's one thing to traffic in this area a little bit, 
but at the same time, you'd like to walk away with here, from here with something you can use. Well, I'm hoping what you can use, first of all, is a realization that any imagined conflict between the one and three or the three and one emerges from our personal finite models, not from, and you're dealing here with the intrinsic architecture of the Godhead. Let's get serious, guys. That plurality can coexist with unity. That's the issue. That's the issue. One God, but in three persons. One of the things that's interesting to do is to take all the attributes of God and you'll discover that they are ascribable in Scripture to each of them. Infinite power to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in different places. Omniscience, om omnipresence, holiness, truth, benevolence, you, you, you name it. And you can find passages that uniquely, uniquely ascribe each one of those to a specific person of the Trinity. You can also take all the works of God, the creation of the universe, ascribed to the Father in Psalm 102, to the Son in Colossians 1 and John 1, to the Spirit in Genesis 1 and Job 26 and so forth. All the works of God, the major ones, the creation of the universe, the creation of man, the incarnation, the life and ministry of Christ, the death of Christ, the atonement itself, the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of all mankind, the inspiration of the scriptures, the authority of the ministry of the gospel, the indwelling presence may surprise you. The Holy Spirit is not the only one that indwells you. Father and Son do also. Check Ephesians 4, 6 for the Father, Colossians 1, 27 for the Son, as well, of course, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The work of sanctification, ascribed to all three, each of the major attributes of God, each of the major works of God, ascribed specifically in Scripture to each, distinctly, each of the three persons of the Trinity. The worship of God, and so on. So, kind of interesting. Now, so the, the concept of Trinity is something that uh, can be practical as we really get into it, because you need to to be comfortable with that, through faith, through revelation, not through theological arguments. But the other reason I think this is an interesting study is because as you get into this, you also begin to behold the majesty of the word itself. How the subtleties behind the language amplify the central truths in the scripture. Now the question is, gee, can you use this? Um, let me give you an example of one way you might use this, sort of. Um, the doorbell rings, and you got a couple of people out there that want to talk about the scriptures. <laughs> I really blew it the other day. The ministry, because of, uh, of where we live, we live in a very remote area, and the ministry had an electric gate put on our property just to keep the, give us a little better security. And uh, they can drive up and push the button and talk. And I uh, had a couple people want to come up and talk about the scripture. And I happened to be kind of in a hurry, and I turned it down. And as soon as I did, and they drove away, I thought, how stupid. I should have opened the gate, let them come in, and then closed the gate behind them. <laughs> I, I, I failed the Lord, not the first or last time, I'm sure, but I remember I felt I really blew it. If that gate ever had an eternal purpose, I blew it. Anyway. But when you encounter one of these, a neat place to start is Isaiah. You might want to make a list of six little verses as we go here. First one, you say, gee, let's, let's, take, let's go to Isaiah 41, verse 4. And you get to first, or Isaiah, and you can use their Bible for this. That's what's so neat. Isaiah uh, 41, verse 4. It says, Who hath wrought and done it, calling generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and, uh, and with the last, I am He. Here's the first and the last. You ask them, Who is that? And they'll predictably respond. That's, uh, that, of course, is Jehovah God. You say, Oh, okay. Uh, let's go to Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Who is that? Well, that's Jehovah God. Okay, that's pretty good. Let's go to Isaiah 48, 12. By now they're getting annoyed, but they're, you, you, you sort of encourage them to come on. Um, Isaiah 48, verse 12. Hearken unto me, O Jacob, and Israel my called. I am he, I am the first, I also am the last. Well, who's that? Well, of course, that's Jehovah God. So far, it's no problem. Great. From here, we go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 
Verse 8. Revelation 1, 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And they say, who's that? Well, that's, of course, Jehovah God. Okay, let's turn to Revelation 21, 6. And they love this, because these particular people love the book of Revelation. And uh, verse 21, verse, chapter 21, verse 6. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Who's that? Of course, that's Jehovah God. You can, I mean, there's been a very consistent pattern, right? Now you're ready for the close. Right? <laughs> okay, let's go to Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, who was dead and is alive. And who is that? You betcha, the Lord Jesus Christ. What an interesting way to demonstrate, particularly to that mindset, if you know what I'm talking about, the deity of Jesus Christ as a member of the Godhead. It's interesting, most people don't realize, if you look at our commentaries, we have on the front cover the, the Greek, I am the Alpha and the Omega. In the back cover we have the Shema in Hebrew, so to a, Hebrew, to a Jewish person he opens it from the back, right? That's the front page, you know. Anyway, and the, you know, anyway, it's a little design thing, but it's interesting if you look at the Greek, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The word Alpha is spelled out. The word Omega is just the letter Omega. Interesting. See, the beginning is completed. It isn't ended yet. It isn't ended yet. In, in, in my fanciful imagination, I sort of visualize Omega spelled out after the second coming. But as long as we've got, got a couple minutes unallocated here, turn with me, if you will, when you talk about Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end of Jesus Christ, you need to recognize, of course, from John 8 and elsewhere, that Jesus Christ laid claim to be the voice of the burning bush. And, and uh, don't fall into the trap of presuming that Elohim, Yahweh, or Adonai refer uniquely to one member of the Trinity necessarily. They refer to roles or relationships with the Godhead totally. All three are used of all three persons at different occasions. Now, in Zechariah chapter 12, there's a delightful little thing I encourage you to explore if you can. Turn to Zechariah chapter 12 and notice verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Very famous passage, describes the second coming of Jesus Christ, and yet, and of course it alludes to the fact that he's still showing his wounds from the cross. After his resurrection, we know he had his wounds, he showed them to Thomas, you know the story. It's interesting, at his second coming, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, I infer from that that he's still bearing those marks. Very famous passage, Old Testament, what, five centuries before Christ was born. And here we have this interesting second coming perception. But if you can get your hands on a Hebrew interlinear Bible, that's a Bible that has the Hebrew and then under the Hebrew has the English. You can, you can get Greek interlinear years and you get Hebrew interlinear years and you don't have to know a lot to find your way around a little bit and it's kind of fun. But the point is if you take this page, this verse, this page, in the Hebrew, you'll notice that under each Hebrew word there's usually several English words. Each Hebrew word carries a lot of meaning. So there's typically it takes two or three English words under each one to sort of convey the meaning. So if you look at the page, you'll find several English words in a different word order because the Hebrew is in a different word order, but you can follow it if you look at it. Um, as you look at this, though, you'll discover that in this verse there is a word that doesn't have anything under it. There, between the uh, uh, me and the whom, there are two letters. These two letters are the alpha and the tau, 
When used together, they represent a preposition or a connector and they'll modify a word. They're, they're connected typically to the word in the Hebrew when they modify. But in this case, they're not. They're just there, unconnected. And you'll find some scholars say, well, that's just an untranslated word required for grammatical structure. They have, they have their way of, of, of explaining why they, you know, what, what, but it's not translated. But if you look more closely at the word, you realize that it's two letters. The aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and the tav, which is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And I could be justified in reading this as follows. And they shall look upon me, the aleph and the tau, whom they've pierced. In the Greek, it would say, the Alpha and the Omega, whom they pierced. The A and the Z, the Alpha and the Tau. It's interesting, you say, gee, that's kind of interesting. And if you have a computer, if you have hermeneutica or one of the more sophisticated uh, uh, search uh, packages, you can then search in the original language. And if you do that, you'll discover, if you take the Alpha and the Tau, the Et, if you will, and search on it, there are, most of the cases, of course, it's connected. It's used as a, like a prepositional modifier of some kind. But um, there are some places where it floats, just like it does in Zechariah 12.10. One of those places is where we began this evening, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, Bereshit bara Elohim, the Aleph and the Tau created the heavens and the earth. Well, Chuck, you're saying that Jesus Christ is the creator. I didn't say that. John did. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. Same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Colossians, he amplifies, Paul amplifies further, and without Him, um, and by Him are all things held together. He was crucified on a cross of wood. Yet he had made the hill on which it stood. Jesus Christ. A member of the Godhead. The word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible, but the concept is everywhere. It's just our way of summarizing the inference. What do you carry away from tonight? Details about the Trinity? Probably not. Maybe, a, I hope, a heightened curiosity to look, read carefully through the Old Testament and watch for the Trinity because as you start watching for it you'll see it all over implied all over the place even though it's not fully revealed until the Son is revealed in the New Testament then it all becomes clear but the main thing I hope you carry away from our gatherings in general especially at night is a respect for the word every detail 66 books written by 40 authors over thousands of years yet demonstrably engineered supernaturally from outside the time domain itself, writing history before it happens. Your eternity hangs on its promises, its commitments, its insights, its counsel, its instruction. Praise God. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Oh, Father, we just thank you that you are our Father. We thank you, Father, that we are your sons and daughters in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that you've gone to such extremes to reveal yourself to us and that you have provided a mechanism by which we can spend eternity with you in your presence not by our righteousness or any merit that we have but totally in response to the redemption you've provided in Jesus Christ and revealed to us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit so Father we come before you claiming